Hey, what's up? Hello, everyone. Welcome into Fantasy Film Ball, the show where we turn movies into sports and sports into something we don't talk about here. My name is Matt. And my name is Dylan. And today we have something very, very fun to go over because we are diving into our July predictions for best picture, best director, and the screenplay categories. But before we can dive into that, Matt has a very fun announcement to make for all of us today. I just want to remind everyone, this channel is called Fantasy Film Ball because we play a game called Fantasy Film Ball, and that's not just a game for me and Dylan. That is a game that anyone out there can participate in. You get to play against other players, draft a team of awards films, and through the awards season, as those films collect prizes, you collect points and try to win the game through managing the best team possible. If you would like to play this game, and I highly recommend it, it is very fun, join our Discord. It's in the description right down below. So make sure you join in before August 15th to indicate that you are interested in playing the game. And we hope to see you there. We hope to play the game with you this year. Today, as we're going over some of our July predictions, and you know, you could take some of these, you could make your draft boards based off of what we say here today. We're kicking things off with Best Picture, and I'm gonna say first and foremost, I don't know what to do in this category because we have both now seen past lives. That does not seem like a best picture winner. And honestly, nothing else is really jumping off the page. I know you would say color purple, but to me, nothing's really jumping off the page at the moment. And considering that we are in the midst of a SAG strike, that means no actors can be out there promoting their films. So there's a little thought on the back of my head. If this continues throughout the whole award season, which I hope doesn't, I hope the studios come around and give the actors and the writers what they want to feel comfortable working in the field, we could have a sense of where people just default to name checking. And I, I don't know if that would be the case, but that's like at least my first reaction. So Matt, I guess where's your stance with everything right now in terms of, I guess, the award season race as a whole? For one thing, I think this strike is one of the most important things that's happened in Hollywood in the last 20 years. It's about goddamn time that these contracts change to reflect the changing industry and the way that streaming now dominates. But yeah, in terms of the awards race, it is going to be very interesting to see how potentially not having any actors on the campaign trail, what is going to be a campaign in the era of not having hot ones, not having the variety actors round table? What's it gonna look like having the Golden Globes with no actors showing up? I don't know if the strike will last that long, but presuming it does, that will change the game. And a lot of the theories that we've had of like, ooh, well, you know, there's gonna be an actor that people are just gonna wanna root for and it's gonna carry the film to the best picture. That might not be a credible way of going about things maybe it'll be different this year and while you say that you think they might just name check a big director like Martin Scorsese I don't think it's that simple I think critics are going to be incredibly important this year in saying these are the films you should go see that's where I think we're going to see the for your considerations now instead of it being the typical ads we'll still see we just won't see it involving the actors but I think critics are going to have a lot more push this year I don't think they're just gonna name check Scorsese is what I'm gonna say if anything Thing, I think it'd be more likely that they name check Nolan because Scorsese for one thing already has one This doesn't seem like the best movie of his career Oppenheimer is getting some of those reviews that seem like it could be top one top two top three Nolan films, whereas I feel like some people are probably not even going to put Killers in the top five Scorsese, which is going to be a detriment later down the race. It could be Nolan, it could be someone else, but at least for this moment right now, we know that Killers has screen. we know that the majority of people really like it, they may not say it's his best, but they really like it, and for people who aren't critics who are still voting, they know who Scorsese is, he may not be out there on the trail saying, vote for me, vote for me, but he will still do public events, and he'll still go with this film, and that could be enough to carry it into to, like I said before, I don't feel great about anything at the moment. All I know is it's probably not past lives after seeing it. At the moment, you can see my list over here on the side. I don't feel great about anything, but what I do feel great about at the moment is keeping my 5-5 five -five split between first-time nominees and returning nominees because I had past lives in there. I had the Zone of Interest, Color Purple, May December, and Anatomy of a Fall, all from directors who have never been nominated before. And then Kills of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, Dune Part 2, Poor Things, and Air have all been from directors who have received nominations in the past so that's basically my main update here for best picture there's not a lot saying here nor there i kind of feel content with how things are at the moment but we're quickly approaching on the fall festival season so it's time for stuff to start shaking up something that i think isn't going to change this year is i do think just naturally people gravitate towards the underdog story there's always something really endearing about the film that nobody thinks can do it that then 
does it. And what I want to put out here is a film as a potential Best Picture winner. I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm just saying that I think people aren't giving it enough credibility, including you. You don't even have it in your top 10. I want to put forward the possibility of a film that might not be hurt on the campaign trail because it doesn't have actors that need to get out there to promote it. I mean, it has voice actors, but it doesn't have the traditional stars in this movie. And that is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This is going to be a top three critics movie at the end of the year. Just think about it this way. Last year, critics awards were split between Everything Ever All at Once, Tar, and The Banshees of Nisharan. This year, it's very likely that those critic awards are going to be split between Zone of Interest, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and Past Lives. Or some combination of those three, maybe add in Killers of the Flower Moon, maybe add in Oppenheimer. But at the end, I really do think Spider-Man is going to be one of those three movies that critics just won't shut the hell up about. I do think Spider-Man should at least be in your 10, but I do think it's a credible threat, also because I think it's a very credible threat to win adapted screenplay, which means that it should be up there for Best Picture. No, I completely hear everything you're saying. My big thing, like I mentioned last time we talked about Best Picture and including our Across the Spider-Verse review, is I'm basically just going to wait on this movie. Once I see people actually nominate it, then I'll accept it, but I'm not going to make the same mistake I did last year with Pinocchio. So at the moment, I do have that number 12. It's not like I have that like 20 or something. It's just outside where easily I can slide it up in, like, especially if I want to take out air or if I want to take out May December or even poor things. It's just for this moment right now, I have it just sitting out. I just want to see someone commit to it first and then I'll gravitate towards it. And I appreciate your caution, but I do think that we have to admit this is very different from Pinocchio. Pinocchio started with a really high critic rating and it just dropped. It went from like a 92 all the way down to a mid 70s on Metacritic. It's had great Rotten Tomatoes reviews, but Rotten Tomatoes doesn't mean anything. Plus it was on Netflix. It didn't get a chance to be in the cultural conversation. This movie is like going to end up being one of the highest grossing movies of the year. I would say be optimistic on this one. Other things that I'm noticing here in your list, I think you're a little bit too confident in May, December still. What we're seeing with May, December and Netflix's slate in general is a changing of priorities. May, December is starting to look a lot more like the two popes than it is marriage story, for example. We're starting to see how the fall slate is shaping up and it really seems like the killer is going to be Netflix's big push. They want it to go to Venice. They have big aspirations for this movie. So I would swap out May, December, put the killer in. I fully get that. And if I were to remove a film from my top 10, it would either be Air or May, December at the moment. I hear about the killer still. I just want to wait for some official confirmation with stuff along those lines. May, December though, is the open night film at New York Film Festival. So what it seems like to me, at least, is Netflix is going to treat this like a Bardo from last year. I know that's not a great comparison in terms of awards, but like it's going to get a lot of eyes on it throughout the year and then come out on the service late November, sometime in December. So that's where I'm holding out for for a little bit. But if we get the Venice lineup and in like two weeks and says, hey, the killer's going there. Maestro's going there. Then maybe I'll gravitate a little bit more towards those films because if you see my lineup over here, I do have the other three main Netflix movies all in a row. So they're all just right outside my tent. The Holdovers is there. Could easily slide that in if I want to take out Air. And then we have Barbie. If I take out a Warner movie, maybe that could slide in. Then we have the Netflix options instead of May, December. And then we have some other random stuff down there. I mean, Spider-Man's included in that that could take out Anatomy of a Fall at my number 10 slot. I do think Dune actually has like a, a bit of a chance of moving in the schedule. What do you think about that? Because I have a feeling Warner Brothers really wants Chalamet, Zendaya out there because they need this to be a box office sensation. I don't see them moving it, at least at this moment. I mean, they just put out a second trailer a few weeks ago. The only reason I think they would move is if the movie's not done yet. I feel like, yes, having those two people out there to promote the movie would help, but I also feel like the movie has a built-in enough fan base where people will come out and the word of mouth from just a general audience will carry. Maybe I have it a little too high. That last trailer really sold me, and mm -hmm. the more I just oh sit God. back and think of the Color Purple trailer, it just keeps dropping a little bit for me. I think I had Blitz as my number five in director, and I really want to take him out, but I don't know who's the best alternative to put in in his spot at the moment. On that point, though, do you think that there are any films in our Best Picture list right now that are at danger of moving because of the strike? In my 10, at least, the only one that could would be Dune Part 2. I could see the color purple moving. I yeah. Honestly, this is wild. But what if Killers of the Flower Moon moves? See, I, I don't know if that would move because it's already had its initial set of 
press with the cast and stuff. It's like, yeah, maybe they can't go out there for a second time when the movie's closer to being out, but you already have recorded promo. You already have interviews. You already have Mm -hmm. stuff like out there. So maybe I don't know the legality and stuff all like that, but you could always just repurpose what you've already had before and just put it out again. I could see Maestro. I could see Saltburn move. Dumb Money seems in in very dire danger of a move. That ensemble is so huge, and they're really going to fly under the radar if you can't get, like, Seth Rogen out there talking about this movie. But I think Maestro actually might be at the highest risk of a push. That's the interesting thing, though. I'm really interested to see what happens, because I know there's a little rumblings of Maestro going to Venice, and if it does go to Venice, and let's say the strike is not over at that point... What does Bradley Cooper do? Because he's a member of SAG and a DGA. Obviously, for SAG reasons, he can't be there. But for DGA, they have an agreement. So by that point, he could go and only talk directing stuff. But obviously, journalists would be like, oh, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? What do you think of your acting? And it would become a very tricky line to walk. And yeah, once again, I know there's not a lot of exciting updates. But that's because at the time of recording, haven't seen Barbie, haven't seen Oppenheimer. They come out in just a few days. So when both those movies come out, there will be fluctuations on this chart Maybe Oppenheimer goes to one. Maybe I'm dumb enough to put three Warner Brother movies in my top 10. We'll just have to wait and see, but looking a little bit lower down on my chart, I mean, Napoleon just had a new trailer. We had a whole Mm -hmm. trailer discussion about it. I don't really see this being a picture player, even if it hits all those technical nominations. Ferrari's probably going to Venice, which maybe could boost this movie up a little bit, but it just doesn't seem like a picture type player to me where it could still snag technicals and maybe even Adam Driver. You can see the list of the lower movies here. There's Mm -hmm. chances here, just nothing. Nothing's really speaking to me out loud. And as you see, there's one glaring admission, Bob Marley, One Love, because this movie is not coming out this year. The trailer basically confirmed that. So there's no need to even have it on here as a hypothetical until they say, hey, limited on Christmas. I'm a little bit surprised that Napoleon is so low on your list because I know you have it in a few other categories. So I would expect it to be a little bit higher. Personally, I would have Napoleon very low. I think I've got it like 22, 23 but I would expect to see it higher from you just knowing where you lie with Napoleon. Otherwise, I'm a little bit surprised not to see Priscilla at all on this list. I think that there's some that are definitely weaker than Priscilla, as weak as you think Priscilla is. Same with Asteroid City. No matter how weak you think Asteroid City is, it's definitely stronger than, like, El Conde, Dumb Money, The Bike Riders. I don't know. I, I don't see any like glaring emissions on your list. I think it's it's pretty solid at this point. We're going to know a lot more Friday, Saturday, when we finally get around to seeing Barbie and Oppenheimer. Without further ado, let's move over to Best Director, which I'm going to take this week. So at number one, I have Blitz Bazawule for The Color Purple. Still, my reasons remain the same. If The Color Purple is a Best Picture winner, which I do think it has a very strong shot at, it's got to win here because it's not winning in screenplay. And traditionally, a film would need to win either screenplay or or director in order to win Best Picture. Now, a counterpoint there is Chicago from 2002, which lost Best Adapted Screenplay to The Pianist and lost Best Director to The Pianist for Roman Polanski. Yikes. There is a potential route to win Best Picture without, but you kind of need Best Director. So that's why I've got Blitz at number one. I want to see more from the movie, but since I'm still very confident in The Color Purple, it goes here. Now at number two, if The Color Purple does not win here, who is going to win? Now a lot of people would say Scorsese. I'm going to say Christopher Nolan. I've been lower on Oppenheimer all year long, and that's not because I wasn't excited for the movie. It was because I was going out of an abundance of caution, because I've been burned before. Now that the reviews are out, now that we see people talking about this movie as a masterpiece it could be the film that snags christopher nolan a best director oscar i think it's much more likely than scorsese as i said earlier in in your best picture section people are talking about oppenheimer as a top three nolan movie even people that don't like nolan seem to really be digging Oppenheimer quite a bit. Then at number three, I have Jonathan Glazer for The Zone of Interest. I think this is this year's international directing spot that we always have in here. Uh, Zone of Interest is going to be very strong with the artsy side of the Academy, and they are going to push for it to get a nomination in Best Director. 
the way that we saw last year with Triangle of Sadness, Ruben Ustland. That is a very clear nominee, maybe not a winning shot, because it's not a very accessible film for the masses. It's definitely a passion pick that is going to get a nomination. Then at number four, Martin Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon. It's still one of the biggest movies of the year. It might not be top five Scorsese, but hey, neither was The Irishman, and he did get a nomination for that, and he will get a nomination for this one. But I'm not going to make the Spielberg mistake last year where we say, oh, well, they got to reward him again. You know, they, they got to reward him again they they haven't in so long this is a good way to make up for it they didn't do it last year why would they do it this year there has to be a really good reason to give him an award not just it's his time then at number five i have celine's song for past lives past lives is feeling weaker and weaker to me by the day i'm feeling like the hype is dying back a little bit now that's going to be revived at the end of the year with critics lists for sure which i think is going to be enough to push celine's song into best director what i mean when i say the hype is dying a little bit i don't feel like people are talking about this as a picture winner anymore. It seems like what at one point looked like a three acting nomination movie is now like a one to maybe two acting nomination movie, which is going to hurt the film when it comes to best picture, best director. I could see Celine Song miss for that, and I think it would be a massive, massive snub from what was expected early on in the year. Yeah, no, I agree with your top five with the same people just, you know, mixed and matched in a different order. Glazer's really interesting to me because even if Zone of Interest misses picture, I could still see him make director a la Cold War from a few years ago. Scorsese, I mean, he's probably going to be like Spielberg where, yeah, he's in there, but a winning chance, who really knows? I would say if the strike continues and if Killers or Oppenheimer becomes the best picture frontrunner just due to whatever reasons, though that director probably leads their way to the top of the list. And Celine's song to me at the moment is definitely out of wing contention and director but still feels very safe in there and i would say she's at three or four for me the nominations package for past lives kind of keeps dwindling the only thing keeping it in win contention right now is the fact that this is the likely original screenplay winner but it's very possible that gets dethroned once we see the holdovers once we see salt burn but just outside of my top five to continue my director list i have david fincher for the killer now david fincher every time he's gotten a nomination for best picture, which is three times now, Curious Case of Benjamin Button, The Social Network, and Mank. All of those times, he has also gotten a Best Director nomination. Does that mean that he has to come along with it this time if The Killer is in Best Picture, which I do think it is at this point? I don't think so, because I think of The Killer more as The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo would have been nominated for Best Picture if there was a solid 10 nominees. That's the way I feel about The Killer. If this movie's like number nine, number 10, David Fincher doesn't need to come along with it. But if it's a really strong movie, we know the director's branch likes David Fincher, he could very easily get in there. My number seven pick is one that a lot of people are going to say, no fucking way, that's ridiculous, take that out. If I'm taking this movie seriously, as a Best Adapted Screenplay winner, if I'm taking this movie seriously in Best Picture, if I'm looking at what people are talking about with this movie, saying what speaks to them about this movie, it's the creative vision. It is the animation, it's the visual style, it's the way it all comes together. We've never seen an animated movie get a directing prize, but if any movie could do it, it's probably this one. Just think about a possible passion push that we could see from critics happen. And if that happens, we could see something similar to what happened with the Daniels last year, where people go, oh, no way. No way, yeah, it's a directing heavy movie, but the Academy doesn't do duos. Maybe they'll do an animation team for this year. I'm not gonna predict it because it's a little too wild, but it's possible. Then afterwards, just to rattle off a few other possibilities, Alexander Payne for The Holdovers, they love him, but his movies are very low key. He doesn't need a directing nomination. Justine Trier, Anatomy of a Fall, who is another international contender if Jonathan Glazer does not get in. Yorgos Lanthimos, Poor Things. This is a visually stunning movie, and Yorgos is going to get a ton of praise for how bold this vision is. Also worth mentioning Bradley Cooper for Maestro, Greta Gerwig for Barbie, Hayao Miyazaki for The Boy and the Heron, as well as Denis Villeneuve for Dune Part 2. I mean, at least the first thing is if you're saying I have X movie way too low or way too high, you don't even have Villeneuve in your top. 10, which is, seems very crazy. I guess the way that I see it is I think that Warner Brothers is going to lower and lower and lower Dune in their priorities for campaigning. They're going to think the movie campaigns itself. It will to a point, but if Villeneuve couldn't get in for the first movie, I don't see why he'd get in here. We're seeing the Academy move away from this 
like very special effects heavy direction in their directing nominees. We used to get like Alfonso Cuaron for Gravity, James Cameron for Avatar. We used to see those being a staple of the best director lineup, but we haven't seen that lately. The only narrative that Denis Villeneuve really has to get a directing nomination is the fact that he didn't get nominated last time. We've both said that this movie looks a little bit more visually impressive throughout, and that would go to the director, but I also don't have Villeneuve in my five at the moment. Him and Blitz I have as my five, six, just lean a little bit more towards Blitz at the moment for Color Purple, but as I said, my faith in that is dropping a little bit more and more each day, but overall, I have no real qualms with your top 10. I mean, we have nine of the same 10, just switch out Villeneuve for the Spider-Verse trio. It's a hard year, and we're gonna see some of these get trimmed down, but um, yeah, Denis, I think, has an uphill battle. All right, well, that brings us over to original screenplay, which people all year have been saying is kind of the weaker of the two, which as you look at this list here, it looks a little bit weak to me as well. But as Matt just said, in the last category, we're talking about director past lives seems pretty short in this one right here. It's at my number one slot and it will stay like that until something else really just comes out of nowhere and solidifies itself into the race. At number two, I have this in best picture. I know it could drop. Netflix could have other priorities, but that's where I have May, December. From everything that we heard out of Cannes, this seems like a very different type of movie for Todd Haynes, and like, I don't know, maybe voters gravitate towards that a little bit, but like I said before, I have this in picture, so it's gonna come along in screenplay, just like Air. Air is one that doesn't feel like it can win at all, but it feels pretty good in terms of a nomination, even if it doesn't get in the picture or get any other nomination. It could be our solo screenplay nomination for the year. And then at number four and five, I have Anatomy of a Fall and The Holdovers. Yes, I am very low on The Holdovers at the moment, but once eyes are laid on this movie, in terms of a public scene, then I will probably warm more up to it. However, just sticking with a groove, sticking with a tone for month to month instead of switching like a 180 each time I do one of these, I'm gonna keep it low until we have more eyes on it. But that is my top five. I feel pretty solid with these. Maybe the order isn't right, but I feel like these are a good, you know, July picks for what the five could be. I've got the exact same five as you, just in a different order. Past Lives, it does look like the likely winner right now, but what could replace it? And I'd say the most likely winners, if it's not Past Lives, would have to be Anatomy of a Fall, The Holdovers, or Saltburn. I think Saltburn could come in and really shock everyone. That said, it'd be really, really wild to have Emerald Fennell's second script win another Oscar after her first script just won one. It'd be like lightning striking twice. That would be wild. The argument with the holdovers is just it could be a lovely crowd pleaser that wins TIFF and then bam, it gets an original screenplay win because it's just a lovely movie. Anatomy of a Fall, on the other hand, is going to be really complex, very dense, very talky, with a great performance in the center, and it could come in and kind of win over past lives the way that the father won over Nomadland in adapted screenplay back in 2020. The father being a much more talky script, a much more layered, complex story, while Nomadland was a much more quiet, very reflective movie in the same way that I think Past Lives really is. I could see a route for Anatomy of a Fall to win, but yeah, I, I'm gonna stick with Past Lives. It'd be weird not to have Past Lives at number one right now. And you talk about unlikely, and that's how I kind of feel about everything else. My show's at six because if Netflix does falter away from May, December, or The Killer, my show seems like a very viable option. El Conde, maybe I still have it too high, but mm -hmm. I don't want to give up on this movie before eyes are laid on it because I did that last year with various things and then they turned out actually to be kind of worth it. And this year, I'm, I'm going to hold off a little bit. We're, we're in July. There's no need to push anything down before it's actually laid eyes upon. Salt Burns at 8. We've said this numerous times here on the show. I'm not a very big believer in this. We, there's the whole director's second turn is usually a step down. And if it's not a step down, the Academy's not as receptive to it. Salt Burn, like you said, could be a winner contender if it's Amazon's <laughs> main push and it's like a best picture top five. And then 9 and 10 are two movies I don't think I have a shot at all, but they're kind of fun to put here. So give me Challengers, give me Asteroid City. El Conde, I know I was the one that got you onto this in the first place, but when I got you onto it, the reason why I had El Conde so high up everywhere was because I was looking for international contenders, and this was in a pre-can world. This was before I knew that Anatomy of a Fall existed. This was before I really had a ton of confidence in the zone of interest. I was just looking and saying, well, that looks like it could be a really strong contender, but Netflix's slate is shaping up. We have other international contenders, and that's kind of why I have El Conde so low in everything right now. But you're right. I mean, last year I would have taken out All Quiet. I would have 
had it very early on in the year and then went, oh, Netflix doesn't give a shit about All Quiet. Very possible that El Conde just comes out of nowhere. Challengers is a really interesting one because I know you're really, really excited for it. And the screenplay, while not my favorite, it's got some juicy dialogue scenes and it could be, especially if original screenplay is really weak, could be a nomination contender for sure. Definitely not a win contender, but the dialogue kind of goes off. I guess to go back to El Conde just one more time, Pablo Reina is someone who the Academy's been like receptive to but hasn't gone all out for it and who knows maybe this is the time around but just like the last two it's probably on the outside and I don't have it in anything other than international feature but it's at least hanging in those like next in line like in picture where it's in that Netflix like huddle of films like with Rustin and Maestro and The Killer yeah. where one of those could plop up of May December drops just I don't really know which one I know some people would say The Killer some people would say Maestro I was like I'll just keep all of them together. So moving on to the last category of today, best adapted screenplay. And this is going to, this is going to be funny. People are going to be uh, a little wild about this one, I think. Because at number one, I've got Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And before, hold your comments for a little, just give, give me a second to explain. Okay, look, what are the other contenders here? You see a lot of movies that are going to be very acclaimed, but are a little bit more expected. You know, Killers of the Flower Moon is a very classic thriller in the vein of many of Scorsese's other movies. Did The Irishman end up in winning contention for Best Adapted Screenplay? No, because there were more exciting films. Same with Oppenheimer. Is that going to be a very, very well-written story with very complex, layered dialogue? Those types of movies, Killers, Oppenheimer, those aren't the types of movies that win the screenplay categories anymore. Films that are original, even in the adapted category, films that are original, films that are exciting, films that make people look at story in a new way. And Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse has that. I think that if this movie gets in here, it is going to do extremely, extremely well. If Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse manages to make it into the top five here, it feels very much like Jojo Rabbit, like Everything Ever All at Once, like so many of these winners that we've had in the past in this category. They like the things that are different. They like the things that are funny, exciting, new, and Spider-Man has that. So yeah, I think it can win here. And because it can win here, that's why I've got it high up in other categories too. I've got Oppenheimer, then Killers, both of which I've kind of already talked about a little bit. They are both very strong movies with strong screenplays, but they're traditional and traditional does not win here, but they are the type of things that get nominated year after year. So I'm not gonna knock them as nominees. I just don't feel either of them as a winner in Best Adapted Screenplay. To round out my top five, I'm gonna put the killer in here because you know what? I'm just gonna go all in on this movie. I think Fincher has something on his hands here. Netflix sure thinks that they have something on their hands here. Like they thought they had something on their hands last year with Bardo or Glass Onion. Yes, very possibly. But I do think that David Fincher is cooking something here. And if he is, adapted screenplay seems like a very, very likely nomination for the film. And rounding out the top five, I have the color Purple. This is a musical and musicals don't win here, but if it's in winning contention for best picture, I would want to see it at least get a nomination. It'd be a little bit weird for it to miss the nomination and then go on to win best picture. Although I'm not saying it's impossible. It would just really need that director win. But yeah, I'm going to keep the color purple in my top five for now. It's just very possible that it does end up being one of the movies that misses. A lot of what you said about Spider-Man, I think could also apply to Barbie. And I know Spider-Man is the movie that we both have more faith in for picture, but that are Argument, I think could also be used for that movie. Dune yep. Part 2 also seems like a Oppenheimer, like a Killers of the Flower Moon, where like it's probably not going to win, but it, it seems like it's probably in the conversation for a nomination. And then Zone of Interest and Poor Things are two other movies I have a little bit more faith in than The Color Purple, but that makes sense because you have that winning best picture. I'll address Barbie first because you're right that everything I said about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse could apply to Barbie, but you'll see I have Barbie at number eight. The thing that's holding me back about Barbie is that even though it's getting all of this acclaim, it's getting all this love, it is going to be a bit of a cultural phenomenon the same way that Spider-Man is, although I think a little bit lesser maybe. I do think that because the story seems to be like a pretty traditional fish out of water type story in the same way that like Elf was a few years ago, I could be completely wrong about this. 
I haven't seen the movie yet, but it looks like that same type of thing. You know, character from a magical world goes to the normal world, finds that things are very different, and then kind of changes their point of view through this experience. The fact that it is such a familiar storyline, even though the themes might be really new, even though it might be a really wacky, fun take on the material, I could see this winning. If it's in the top five, I could see it winning. I just don't think it's going to be top five because I don't think it's a picture nominee. I still think it's just a crafts nominee. I think it's going to be production design, maybe costume design, maybe makeup. But if it is in, it could win. Same with Poor Things. If Poor Things makes it in, it could also be a winner here because it has that same kind of feel of freshness, of excitement, of, of uniqueness to it. The Zone of Interest, I've got it my number six which you mentioned you have a little bit more confidence in. The reason I don't, there's no real plot here. It's a Holocaust movie where we're in a house outside of Auschwitz the entire time. There's no real plot to it, no real conflict, and that's going to hurt it when it comes to this. It's going to be such a unique and different style of screenplay that I just don't see it as, uh, as a nominee here because it's going to be very cold, very different. Some people will question what the hell the movie's even about in the first place. Then Dune Part 2, as you mentioned, I've got this a little bit lower. I know that the first one did really, really well in adapted screenplay, and I think that is because of the world building in that one. It had a lot of heavy lifting to do in establishing this universe and establishing who the Fremen are, establishing Arrakis and the conflicts between the houses. Now that that's established, the film can do a lot more just general action scenes, set pieces. Also, Eric Roth is not writing this one, and I just don't know if it's going to have the same pull for a screenplay nomination that the first one did. Lastly, I just want to mention Strangers as a potential if it shows up at Venice, very strong, and Blackberry also as a potential if Glenn Howerton somehow makes his way into the race, people watch the film, Blackberry could enter into the conversation for adapted screenplay. Well, with all that being said, everyone out there, we want to thank you so much for tuning to this edition of Fantasy Film, but we went over our mid-year Oscar predictions, and we started off with Best Picture, Best Director, and both screenplay categories. So let us know down below what are some of your mid-year picks. If you made it this far, though, consider dropping a like, a subscription. We would love to hear your thoughts, but until next time, my name is Dill. And my name is Matt, and this is Fantasy Film Ball.